Good morning. How, how many Christmas movie fans in the house? How many Hallmark fans in the house? Okay. Fellas that didn't raise your hands, just go ahead and put them up. Okay. It's all right. Uh, we don't, I, I don't mind them in my house. We, we, I'm actually fond of them because now I've started playing my own little game with them. Like trying to tell the plot before it ends. I'm like, you know, you know, right? Like they're going to meet at that gazebo and kiss at the end. That's what's going to happen. So I, I do my best to try to ruin the moment. But uh, hey, so glad that you're here. Uh, welcome to Awkward Christmas. How many of you know Christmas is awkward? Say amen. How many of you have a co cousin Eddie in your own family? Say amen. If you said, didn't say amen, it's a good chance that you are the cousin Eddie in your family. And, uh, and that's okay, too. Everybody needs one. Uh, we are, uh, it's good to be home. Jennifer and I had an opportunity this week to do some, some traveling. We got to be in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and um, up into Nevada. The last couple days, we were able to visit with the Southwest Indian Mission Association. And it is an organization that goes into the reservation communities uh, in Arizona. In Arizona, there are about 30 different Indian reservations, and not many of them have evangelical churches on them. And so, a great mission opportunity that we got to investigate and kind of check in and see uh, what that could look like as far as a partnership in the future and, and trying to get the gospel out to where it's not. Uh, that's the goal of us as believers, amen? If the gospel is not out there, we want to make sure it gets where it needs to be. And so, it was a great opportunity. Uh, if you've ever been out west, you understand that there is a lot of... Um, it's brown. It's very brown. Um, the, uh, the, the area where we were at, just coming out of Phoenix towards Parker, Arizona, uh, it's a beautiful drive, but it is a brown drive. And I am from the Ozarks, and I love the Ozarks where it's green. A lot of the time it's green. And so there, to see all that brown made me very appreciative of home. Uh, but we had a great time, got to go there and see some things. I'm not dealing well with jet lag. Uh, two hour time difference in Nevada and where we flew out of yesterday. So literally we ate breakfast at the airport and then flying home by the time I landed in Dallas, the sun was setting and my body doesn't know what to do with breakfast. And then two hours later, the sun's setting. Um, and so we got in last night about 11 and I said, man, I, she, this morning was not easy, but I love you. So I'm here. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I wouldn't miss Sunday. I, I love being here when I can be here. And so uh, this morning we start Awkward Christmas. And uh, this idea of Awkward Christmas, some people are like, why? Christmas isn't awkward. It's awesome. But it's awkward. Like the stories we tell at Christmas are awkward. The Christmas story is awkward. Birth from a virgin. You got shepherds showing up to the birth scene. Like, these aren't friend, family friends, these are strangers. And the fact that the Bible never tells the shepherds where to go, other than to the city of Bethlehem, so how did they find said manger, other than knocking on everyone's door to get there? Which is awkward. Hey, we, these angels met us in a field, and is there a baby here? No, moving on, next door. And so, then you got the wise men that most likely showed up about two years later, they don't know the kid. He's a toddler now walking around the house, and they walk in with gifts, one of them representing embalming fluid. That's weird. How many of you are getting that for a birth gift for somebody? <laughs> Hi, here's some gold. Awesome. Here's some embalming fluid. Great. Thank you. That's awkward. It's, and so there's a lot of weirdness with Christmas, and so we're going to just kind of approach it that way. Uh, you're going to do ugly sweaters. You're going to do all kinds of stuff this holiday season because it's what we do, and we just kind of embrace it. And so that's what we're hoping over the next several weeks. We just kind of embrace this series. And I pray that you learn something from it. We're going to talk through the idea of Mary today in this initial conversation that happened. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. And the premise that I want to kind of land on is this, this phrase, it's really happening. And, and we have this moment where, I don't know if you've ever had this moment where your expectation and your reality don't quite match up. Anybody ever have that? How many of you are married in the house? Say amen. amen. How many of you, your picture of marriage is a little different oh, yeah. than the reality of marriage? I counsel with young couples, and it's so fun to talk with them. And, and as they come in, and one of the questions that I talk about, we talk about intimacy, we talk about finances, we talk about all those things, because without fail, everybody has an expectation of what marriage looks like. This is, this is what it's supposed to be like. And without fail, 
that expectation is almost 100% of the time different than the other person's expectation of what marriage is supposed to look like. And so when I deal with these couples in marriage counseling a lot, or pre-marriage counseling, a lot of times it's just making sure that we kind of narrow that gap of reality versus expectations. To make sure that, because here's, here's one of the, and this isn't original to me, but this, the idea of what's called the expectation gap is if you have an expectation and it's here, and then your reality happens and it's here, what fills the middle is stress and tension, right? So like, if you expect your spouse to do the dishes and they don't do the dishes, there's a tension that begins to build in you. You say, well, dishes isn't really a big thing. Well, what if you expect your spouse to spend money a certain way, but the reality is they don't spend money a certain way, or they don't save money like you expect them to save money. Intimacy is another one we talk through with young couples, and, and I try to make it awkward as I can with young couples when they come in. It's just one of the joys of my job. And so we talk about intimacy, and I'll go, hey, I just, let's just get this out on the table. Young couple sitting in my office, let's talk about this. How often monthly do you plan on being intimate with one another? Uh, do you mean sex? Sure. Yeah, let's talk about it. They look at me with really big eyes, and then I say, no, 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 I don't want you to think. I, I want you to write down a number on this page, and I want you to write down a number on this page. Since I have been doing marriage counseling, no couple has ever came in and landed on the same number. Not once. It's never happened. And usually the mom numbers are far apart. <laughs> and and it, it varies which one, whether it's the female or the male. It doesn't matter. There's no, real, there's no real landing spot on which one is which. But they always vary. And I go, ooh, what are we going to do about this? And they look at me like I am supposed to answer the question for them. And I'm like, I don't... <laughs> I don't get to answer that question for you. This is, uh, you guys got to talk through it. I'm just here to be a referee and, and to, to kind of help guide in some stuff. And so expectation is a struggle when it meets reality. Marriage, kids, if you've had kids, man, there's an expect. When kids come along, kids are going to be awesome. And they are, for the most part. Right? How many of you had great expectations of children until that first diaper that left the boundaries of its diaper? You know what I'm talking about? Some of you know what I'm talking about. And you're like, uh-uh. Ah, ah. Then sign up for this. I just need a water hose and some gloves, and I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Or when you assume, like, I, I can remember, like, thinking that, man, when my kid, uh, our kids are going to always be dressed nice when we go out in public places. And literally, there's times that we pick up Brindley from the daycare, and Jennifer's like, is that a pajama top that Brindley's wearing to school today? Yeah, yeah, it is. I thought it matched your pants. Why is she wearing shorts? It's December, because they're warm shorts. <laughs> the shoes don't match, and it's just whatever you can kind of, So there's this expectation gap sometimes. It's the same as true in faith and in ministry and, and in just the reality of what we believe about the gospel. There's, there is sometimes a difference in what we believe about the gospel, what we believe about God, and the reality of it. Mary and Joseph walked through this because, you see, they had been taught to believe. They had been raised with a Bible teaching. They were both young Jewish people that in their communities would have been started. They would have started in school. They would have, been, they would have learned about the history and the prophecies concerning Jesus. They would have learned about them concerning the Messiah, the one who is to come, the one that's going to set things straight. So from the time they were little, they had been taught about what Isaiah said about the wonderful counselor. They would have been taught about what Moses had written in Genesis about this one who would come and he would, he would crush the serpent's head. And, and they had been taught all this history and all this prophecy about what was to come, and they had built an expectation, and then one night an angel shows up and says, oh, by the way, you're a part of it. That's a lot, right? That's a lot to think through that, to go, whoa, this is really happening, and not only is it really happening, but I'm in the middle of it. I'm a catalyst for it. And so as we talk through today, I want you to start wrapping your mind around this reality that you need to start thinking about it, what happens when what you think becomes real. When what you've been taught becomes tangible. When what you believe actually becomes behaviors. Those kind of thoughts I need you to start kind of processing through as we read through this this portion of the Christmas story. Luke chapter 1, 
starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph and of whose house, who was of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her saying, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. I love verse 29. But she was greatly troubled at this saying. How many of you are going to be greatly troubled if an angel shows up in your room? Let's be honest. Okay? Don't get churchy on me right now. You're freaking out if an angel shows up in your room. She's greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Remember what I said about Mary and Joseph being trained up in the ways of the, they would have known the stories of the prophets. They would have known that when a message from God comes to a human being in order to deliver that message, not all the time was that message a positive message. Think about it. If you read the Old Testament prophets, sometimes there was a prophet that walked in and said, if y'all don't get straight, God's taking the whole town out. And so Mary is trying to discern, wait, 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 wait. I know what I've been taught, and if the angel's here going, I have a message for you. Ugh, this, uh, okay. She's troubled, discerning what this message might be. And the angel begins by telling her. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Man, that's a good speech. You know how much of it Mary heard? She heard conceive in your womb and bear a son because Mary's next line was hold up I'm a virgin all that other stuff is great but there's some logic that's not making any sense to me there there's because I think she's still in this moment where she's trying to connect what she's always believed and been taught to the reality that it's happening I'm a virgin, so this can't happen. I'm betrothed. I'm engaged to be married, but we don't know each other like that, so this is going to be really, really complicated. And then the angel continues, and the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. It's separate. It's going to be different. The Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, your cousin in her old age, she has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month of her who used to be barren. She's six months in, and before this child, she wasn't able to have children. Verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. Some of you right now, you need to write down that verse, Luke 137, and it needs to be your life verse. Because sometimes the devil wins in your head. Sometimes he wins in mine, and it's really reassuring to have a place to go to. When you start thinking like you're not enough or you don't have enough gifts, talents, whatever it is that you think of, well, I can't do that because I'm this. I can't do that because I'm this. I can't do that because I don't have this. You know, I, yeah, I want to do what God wants me to do, but I'm just not that person. Well, Luke 137 says, for nothing is impossible with God. But Vince, you don't understand. My marriage is falling apart. We're not really sure we like each other that much. And I know what's supposed to happen here. We're supposed to fight it out. And we're supposed to make it work. But I think it would just be easier to give up because I, I don't think he wants any part of it or I don't think she wants any part of it. Luke 137, for nothing is impossible with God. Pastor Vince, my kids are out there living like devils now, even though I've tried to raise them in the church, and I can't imagine what's going to happen to them. But listen, you keep praying because nothing is impossible with God. It's a great verse to have in your pocket. It's a great verse to be able to claim in moments where you don't feel like you're enough. Nothing is impossible with God. God, I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability. Nothing is impossible with God. And I love that the angel says this to Mary. He says, hold up, before you start thinking of what can't happen, I need you to think of who's sent me. And who's sent me is the catalyst for it all, and nothing is impossible with him. Verse 38 picks up. Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, we're going to get into Joseph's story a little bit more in the series, but 
I want to just kind of reference this fact because Mary gets this vision from God. The angel shows up in her room and she understands, okay, I'm going to be with child. The problem is I'm, I'm engaged to this man, basically married without a different living arrangement. And so I, I've got to, got to let Joseph know. And Matthew, the book of Matthew tells us Joseph's story, which says, hey, and Joseph being a just man had decided to put Mary away privately. In other words, I'm going to walk through this, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to shred her. I'm, she can go live with Elizabeth. It's out of town. People won't think anything about it, but I don't have to have any part of this. That's not my kid. It's not my child. And so he was a just man. He was a, he was a good man. And so he could have completely decimated her publicly. He could have put her out on the courthouse square or whatever the equivalent to that would have been in Nazareth and raked her over the coals. It would have been horrible what could have happened. But being a just man, being a good man, he said, I'm just going to walk away from this and make sure that Mary's taken care of. But then the same angel, Gabriel, shows up to Joseph in a dream. and says, Joseph, hey, this is the deal. It's real what she told you. It's true. And I need you to do your part. And he does. We don't get a lot of backstory on Joseph, but you've got to understand, just as much as we all think about this young girl, Mary, who was with child out of wedlock and what kind of ridicule that she would have received because the community knew she wasn't married yet. It was a big deal to be married and to be betrothed, and so the community knew she wasn't married yet. But when she starts showing and she starts, it starts becoming obvious that she's with child, not only is she getting the looks, but her husband, her future husband, Joseph, is also getting the looks. Everybody looking at their calendar going, wait a minute, Joseph, you didn't wait, did you? you? You didn't do what you were supposed to do, did you, Joseph? So, yeah, I know Mary's the woman in this scenario, but you're not, you're not innocent. And both of them had to deal with the awkwardness of this, this moment. You see, the, the word awkward, I want to define it before I go in any further. The word awkward has a couple meanings. It's first, first is this, something that is hard to deal with. Okay, so how many of you have awkward relationships in your life? They're awkward, they're hard to deal with, and you, just, you still have to just kind of swallow hard and move on through it. Second one is this, something that causes or creates a feeling of embarrassment. Anybody ever been embarrassed before? My high school play was MASH. It's a military show back in the 80s. And I played Lieutenant Colonel Henry Blake. And I was, had a scene. I had a monologue. <laughs> had a monologue in the school play. And so it was just me in this one scene of the school play. And I'm in front of everybody. And I'm playing a football coach in the scene. And so I am actually coaching the field, which would have been you. And so I'm big and loud and cheering and, and letting it go. And I look off stage over here. And my friends are over here. And they're all laughing. I'm like, I am killing this. Yes. And I look over here and some of my other friends start giving me the universal sign that you never want to see when you're on a platform in front of however many people fit in Dunbar Auditorium. And that universal sign was because my zipper was down the entire monologue. There's no fixing that. There's no, no pause that you get to fix that. It's happened here before and the people in the sound booth doing all kinds of weird sign language and hieroglyphics in the back trying to let me know. And so if there's ever a moment where like I'm in the middle of the sermon and I go, let's pray. That's praying that you all bow your head for a second so I can zip my pants, all right? Now you know, I'm giving it all away. The secrets is just letting you see behind the screen. So afterward, the play, my dad, my mom and dad, mom's like, Vincent, you did a good job. That was good. I'm so proud of you. My dad said, your pants were unzipped the whole time. Thank you, Dad. I feel so encouraged by this. It was awkward. It's really awkward. The second one is this, something that's not smooth. I love that definition of awkward, not smooth. When I proposed to my wife, it was not smooth. But it's okay. There was a history of me not being, I am not a romantic at all. I'm horrible at it, horrible at it. So the first time I asked Jennifer out on a date, we were at the Missing Horse Dance Arena, and I slid across the dance floor with my cowboy boots, my tight-fitting jeans. I asked her if she wanted to dance. She said yes. I thought, yeah, buddy. And my phrase was, hey, if no one else wants to go to Branson with me, would you like to go out on a date? 
<laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> 24 years later, it worked. I figured it out, though. Like, uh, you know how God gives everybody a mission field? I am my wife's. <laughs> I am, I am Jennifer's mission field. I think there are moments that she goes, oh. <laughs> and so I'm okay with it. It worked out for me. But yeah, I, 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 that's how I asked her to marry, and that's how I asked her on our first date. I'm not smooth. Like, there is nothing, I am not good at it. Like, there's not any swagger in me. There's no, like, what's up? No, I don't have that. It just even sounds weird when I try it, you know? So when we got, when I proposed to her, pulled up to the apartment in my work truck. We had been arguing. I put the truck in park. She come out the door. I come, I was walking across the yard. I can take you to the spot in the duplexes over behind the Easy Mart off 201. Take you right to the rock where it happened. And I walked up there and she was frustrated and I was frustrated. It was late because I had to go lead the children's choir at church. And I was like, hey, do you want to get married? She said, yeah. I'm like, cool. I got to go. <laughs> there was no this. My son Parker asked me the other day, he was like, did you have a ring? I'm like, nope. No, nothing. He was like, not even a candy ring or something. I'm like, uh-uh. I was getting out of that fight. <laughs> 24 years later, it's worked. Like I said, now you understand what I say. I am my wife's mission project, all right? And I'm okay with it. But man, I'm not smooth. So that, because I'm not smooth, it can be awkward sometimes. This awkward idea, think about where Mary and Joseph are. This, is, this really, is this really happening moment where the angel comes and talks to us and tells us all that we have ever been taught, all that we have ever learned about, all that we have ever been really a part of is now coming to pass, and we're the crossroads, yeah. Yep. And, and let me just tell you, it's not going to be smooth. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be embarrassing for you to walk through town. And you're not going to know exactly what they say, but you're going to know they're saying something. Have you all ever been in an environment like that? Maybe some of you have had some sort of past. All of us have had a past, but some of you walk through that and you, you know some people talk. It's one of the reasons I told God, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. God, I'll go anywhere. I'll preach. I'll go to Africa, Lord. I'll go to the Arctic. I'll preach to penguins. I'll do whatever you need me to do, Jesus. I will rough it and go to some tropical island and share the gospel. But please, God, please, God, don't send me back to Mountain Home, Arkansas. <laughs> I prayed that, legit prayed it for years. Prayed it, prayed it, prayed it. Like, I just threw it in an extra, I mean, like, when I was praying about anything, and by the way, don't send me to Mountain Home, Arkansas. <laughs> I didn't have anything against Mountain Home. I was from here. Proud to be a bomber, class of 94. Yep, just me. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> totally left me hanging there. Thanks, guys. But I, I love it here. I've always loved it. It's a great place to raise a family. I mean, it's, it's great. Stuff to do. I know teenagers are like, there's nothing to do here. There's nothing to do anywhere. Just letting you know. Right. It's safe or it makes sense. Okay? But I had a great time when I was here. I just didn't feel like, I was like, man, I God, I don't know. I don't know about going back. To, and he was like, Vince, I think I want you to start a church. I'm like, sweet, where are we going? Tropical Island? He's <laughs> like, you're going back to Mountain Home. <laughs> And I started arguing. I'm like, God, I know people. And they know me. And I don't know if it's going to make sense. Like, I was, I, was, I was legit fearful. I was like, God, I, I know. I mean, they knew me in school. Like, like, Monica, you were the first people we, me and Rob met. We rode the bus together starting in junior high in eighth grade. And then, like, in the early service, 8.30 service, one of my junior high football coaches here, and I'm like, oh, he know, I know he's seen me not being a Christian before. So they're not going to believe. Like, literally, the devil was taking me back to 8th grade and ninth grade and going, oh, Van Stern, <laughs> yeah, woo, woo. No, you, no one's going to believe you know Jesus. They may think you need him, but they're not going to believe you know him. That was what the enemy kept telling me. 
for a long, long time, I listened. And I did anything and everything I could do other than come back to Mount Home. Now, hindsight, I look and I go, I think the angels giggled like in heaven when God was like, what? We're going to send you back to Mount Home. And we'll talk about that when I get to heaven, but I'm so thankful that he sent me here because, see, my expectation wasn't the reality. In fact, because I had those relationships, it made a lot of people more comfortable coming in and go, oh, I know Vince. And, and oddly enough, they weren't thinking about the moments. It was just a familiar face. And so some of the guards started coming down. And when some of the guards started coming down, God began to just grow that. And he gave me an opportunity to come back here to home where I love to live. And I love that my kids are here too. I love that this place. And God said, you know what? If you'd have trusted me with the reality instead of putting so much hope in your expectation, you would have had this a lot sooner. You wouldn't have had to worry about it so much. So often we look at this. And so I look at Mary's story and I look at my own story and I go, God, what stops us from experiencing this? Why was Mary able to go, I'm a bond servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me whatever you say. I know it's going to be awkward. I know the next nine months are going to be ridicule-filled and no one's going to get it because there's no way they're going to believe me. But I guess that's what I got. What was it about it? And it was that phrase. Availability and willingness. Now, how many of you know you can be available but not willing? Yeah, see, this is the true thing. When we talk about availability and not willing, or available and not willing, there's times you'll get a phone call on a Saturday. And somebody will be like, hey, what are you doing? If your first statement is, what do you got going? It's because depending on what they say will determine your availability. Like if they're like, hey, you know what? We just wanted to take you out to dinner because we love you so much and think you're awesome. I'll be there. But if they go, I'm moving to a third story apartment. I need help carrying the couch upstairs. You know, I'm pretty busy today. Even though your availability didn't change, your willingness shifted. Mary shows us in her phrase, in her response, which she only responds two times. The first one is, this isn't logical, explain it to me. I'm a virgin, I can't have a baby. The angel explains it to her. Once she gets the explanation, Mary goes, I am a servant of the Lord. The word servant there is bond servant or slave. She's going, basically what she's saying is, I am God's, so no matter what he wants, I'm available. Whatever he wants, I'm available. And you go, yeah, but Vince, you just said not all the time if you're available are you willing. Let me tell you straight up, there would have been moments that Mary probably thought, this is not, jeez, what did I get into? But her next statement is a permission statement. It's the, it's the willingness. It says, let it be unto me everything that you've said. That's that ability to go, yeah, I'm available, but Lord, here I am. Here I am. Go ahead and use me any way you want to. Lord, if it means going back home, then I'll go back home. Lord, if it means going wherever, I'll go wherever. And I don't know what it is in your life, but this idea, this idea that our expectation and the reality, the problem is, is it affects our beliefs. There's this moment where Mary and Joseph were having to deal with what all they knew and it actually becoming reality. And guess what? You and I do the same thing. Most of us have been in church for so long that we have heard all the stories so many times that we almost act as if they're not true, they're just really cool stories. How many of you know Jesus is coming back? Say amen. Amen. See what just happened there? Let me ask you a question. If I were able to tell you under the anointing of the Holy Spirit that in 90 minutes, Jesus is coming back, how many of you would get up right now and leave? I'm just going to warn you, this next part's going to hurt. How many of you, everyone you know, is going to heaven with you? If your answer is no, you just told me that in the next 90 minutes, you'd rather sit here in this church than tell somebody that he's coming, really. See, I love you, but somebody else has to finish the sermon because I'm out. Because I got family members that I need to go call. 
I, I got people that I've worked with, friends, that the reason I ultimately that I didn't know, part of the reason that I came back was so that people that I grew up in that I knew might get an opportunity to know Jesus. And maybe because it was familiar, they might understand, they might just believe me a little bit more because there's, listen, there is a day coming. If we know he's coming back, why is it not so urgent for us? Well, I'll tell you why, because our, our beliefs affect our behaviors. And you see, we've heard about Jesus' is coming back from our parents and their parents and their parents' parents, and he hasn't come back yet. And so what we've got used to, if we've got used to the idea that Jesus is coming back, I just don't know that we truly believe he is because our beliefs affect our behaviors. And sometimes we behave like he's probably not coming back. Or not right now. And I just don't, I don't know... I don't know that I'm okay with my own life in that matter. That I want the gospel to be urgent to me. I want it to be urgent enough that I tell the person that I want to go with me. I want you to go to heaven with me. And so I have to know, I have to know that you know who Jesus Christ is. And so if I know that, I can't just, see what if it really happened? What if what you know becomes truth? What if it becomes real in the moment? What if, what if it's no longer expectation and reality? What if the horn blows and the sky splits and you are actually a part of the beginning of eternity? Who are you taking with you? Who meant enough for you to go tell them? Say, Pastor Vince, I'm, I'm a guest here today. I, just kind of checking out the whole church thing. I get that, and I'm, and I'm thankful that you're here. Everybody starts as a guest at some point. Let me just share this with you. Maybe you're here, and, and maybe this Jesus thing is, is, is distant. It's there. You know it. You understand it, or you, at least you have an idea of it. But as far as it being real, I've seen a meme this week that said, People are crazy. They talk about needing Jesus to go to heaven, and I think I need Jesus just to go to Walmart right now. Amen. And uh, and that's a funny way of saying what I truly believe. You see, I I can't I can't do this life without Jesus Christ. Period. It is not within me to be a good husband. It is not in me. Oh. Lord, without Jesus leading me as a parent, it's not in me. I know myself too well. To lead a church, to lead anything without Christ by my side or going before me, I would make a train wreck of all of it, of the marriage, of the parenting, of the grandparenting. I would make it a, I would make a mess. I didn't have Jesus. And so I had to move because, see, I've been in church my whole life, and I knew all the stories about Jesus. I could quote you scripture. I could tell you the stories. But, see, it wasn't real in my life. It wasn't real. I hadn't really trusted. Just like your expectation of marriage isn't real, you find that out when you step into it. Your expectation of parenting isn't real, you find that out when you hold that child for the first time. And you won't understand it because you don't think that your heart can multiply and then every time God blesses you with a child, your heart multiplies and you're able to love at a level you just can't, it doesn't make sense. And yet, here we stand as the people of God hoping that he comes back not living as if he could or will I hope you make this Christmas awkward because it's awkward to go hey do you know Jesus if you don't you should come hang out with me at church you can sit next to me or if you think I'm weird you can sit behind me but you should come to church with me or maybe if you have a little more boldness you can say hey do you know Jesus no well can I tell you about what he did in my life and it's not going to be comfortable. It's going to be a little awkward. You're not going to have all the right answers. But let me tell you, that friend that you invite, that person that you speak to, their soul is worth every ounce of awkward. 
every second of awkward, it's worth it. And guys, just because this is what I do on Sundays doesn't mean those moments are any less awkward for me. It's still awkward sometimes when I bump into somebody and God goes, ask them. I don't want to ask them. Right now, I'm looking at cookies. I want to look at cookies. Can I just look at cookies at the store? No, I want you to ask them. Where are you going to church? I don't really go to church. Oh, I wish they went to church. <laughs> I'm just being honest, okay? It is, it, believe me, we didn't just put it on the sign because it was catchy. I did it because I... I'm tired of doing church just because it's Sunday. I want to do church because of the grace of God that has been poured into me. I want to tell people about this Jesus, not because it's the thing to do and we've got great music. No, because they're, they're going to miss heaven if I don't say something. And if it means it's awkward for me, then it's awkward for me. If it means it's awkward for them, then I hope they love me enough to get through a few moments of awkward so we can get to a real conversation about eternity. Hope. Because that matters. It's the only thing that matters. And so I pray your Christmas is awkward. I pray it's urgent. I pray that God places something within you that you cannot get away from. That those people that come to mind, that you start thinking about, what if I had 90 minutes? What if I had an hour and a half to tell as many people as I could, who would I go to first? Who would I follow up with after that? I pray there are names and faces that come to your mind even right now. And you go, that's who I need to talk to. That's who I need to call. Somebody called me after the second service and said, I got to go. I'm like going to grab lunch. He said, no, I'm going to grab my phone. I have to tell these people what you shared in there because I stopped thinking about them as I just figured they'd come around. I can't be comfortable with that anymore. Christians, you are never called at any point in scripture to be comfortable we were called to be convicted that this world would change through our witness go change the world bow with me church a couple of things I want to just ask you if you're here this morning you say Pastor Vince I want you to just pray for me because I need more urgency in my faith need more urgency with the gospel. If that's you this morning, would you say, would you just lift up your hand and say, Pastor Vince, I need to be more urgent with the God. I need to tell people. Like, it's that important. I need to tell them. Yeah, I see your hands everywhere. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe you're here and you go, Pastor Vince, I've heard this story a lot. But I don't know that it's real to me. I mean, I get it. Jesus came and he lived this life and, you know, then somewhere around April they crucified him. And three days later he got up. I know the story, but I don't know that it's really real. I don't know that it's real to me. I don't know that it's real down in my heart and in my mind as much as it is just something I've always known or always believed. If you would be so brave to say, Pastor Vince, I don't know if my behaviors truly reflect what I believe. That sometimes I just live like he's not coming back. If that's you, would you do the same thing and just lift your hand so I can pray for you? So everybody's aware my hand is up. This is me sometimes too, I'm just as guilty. Maybe here you just don't know him. Maybe here this is the first time in church of any kind. And if so, man, thank you so much for trusting me with an hour of your time, trusting us with an hour of your time. First of all, let me tell you that I'm honored because I know the time is so valuable, and you gave it some, you gave it here. But also let me tell you that there is a Jesus that loves you more than you could possibly wrap your mind around. And although you may not understand it, and I will tell you first and foremost that church people, Christians, we're not perfect, we're far from it. The God we serve is pretty spectacular. The Jesus that gave everything for us is pretty amazing. 
and I would love to introduce you to him. I'd love for you to meet this God that walks me through every day, that helps me be the husband I need to be, that helps me be the dad I hope to be. That even though I didn't want to, he called me back here and put me in the greatest church on the planet. He'd really like to meet you. And I'd really love to introduce you. So if that's you today, say, Pastor Vince, I don't, I don't know him, but I think I'd like to. Would you just lift your hand and put it right back down? I'm not going to come to you. I just I want to pray for you. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, I see you. service over to Aaron. I want you to know that I love you and I want God's best for you. And God's best for you from the beginning of time has always been his son Jesus. He's always been the answer. And I pray that you find him. I pray that you would seek him out. That you come find me, that you come find one of the pastors, you come find somebody in the church that you trust and just go, hey, tell me about this Jesus. Tell me a little more about him. And allow them to introduce you to Christ. Father, I come to you, I thank you, and I give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, the credit that is due only to you. God, I pray that we would learn to follow you, that we would seek you, so Lord, you promised that if we seek you, we'd find you. But Lord, teach us to be urgent with our faith. Teach us to be comfortable in the awkward, even though that doesn't seem like it makes sense. We'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name.